In the last episode of Growing Carnivorous Plants, we built a large terrarium to fit five species of these carnivores, which wasn't quite as simple as it seems. A moisture gradient was created using a water reservoir and sphagnum-filled PVC wicks. We used different soil compositions throughout the terrarium to promote the flow of moisture and root growth. On top of that, we have varied the topography to access each layer of soil to allow us to give the plants the best location for their needs, as well as a special way of providing humidity through the transpiration of live red sphagnum moss, which has been growing in our terrarium since the last episode. Enough talk though, let's give a warm welcome to the terrarium's new occupants. This here is a juvenile Cephalotus follicularis. It's quite small right now, and will take some time before it starts producing mature traps. We then have two small Tracera Adelaide giants, which I've learned prefer sphagnum moss as a potting medium in my care. Following that is another sundew, a mature Tracera Bermanii Humpty Dew, in flower. Then, I have four Dracera Pulcella pink flowers in flower as well. And our final occupant is going to be a giant clump of Utricularia sandersonii, following the flower theme. All of these plants have been found growing wild in Australia, hence why I named our terrarium Humpty Doo. And before we go ahead and get these little guys planted, I'd like to welcome you to Hypnotic Exotics. <laughs> So, we have this awesome terrarium, some radical plants, and everything we need to keep them happy. But, with these resources, we still need to make educated decisions about where in the enclosure they would do their best. We can't just put them anywhere in the terrarium. They all have different needs that can be met by the different zones provided during construction. Our water-loving plants are definitely going to have to stay lower in the terrarium, where there's going to be a higher amount of moisture as well as humidity. Whereas, our plants that are more prone to rot are going to need to stay higher up, where there's going to be less water in the soil as well as more fresh airflow. And even with them in their places, they still need to be accessible for feeding and pruning, with our smaller plants staying closer towards the top. When we get all our plants potted, we're still going to need to provide a smooth acclimation period as well. Decreasing the amount of shock and disturbance will be priority, and I'll go over a method for this later in the video. And remember that fan from the last episode? It actually drew too much moisture from the terrarium, drying out the sphagnum. But it still might be essential once the plants are acclimated, as transpiration leads to a higher humidity, and if that air is stagnant, it could lead to rot. But on a more positive note, I've also acquired something special to bring even more life to this terrarium, which will be one of the final steps of this video. Now, although we finished our terrarium in the last episode, we're still going to need some more supplies for our endeavor here. Starting off, you're going to need a butter knife or a small spoon, some saran wrap, some water that's been purified by distillation or reverse osmosis, and that small fan, just in case. Not a lot needed for this episode, so now that we have our supplies ready, we can begin to get these guys into their new home. The first plant to be put into our terrarium is going to be Utricularia sandersonii. Known as the Sanderson's bladderwort, Utricularia sandersonii is a terrestrial bladderwort native to South Africa and recently recorded to grow in the Blue Mountains area of New South Wales. Bladderworts, specifically, are the most widespread genus of carnivorous plant, with over 200 species spread all over the world. These plants have bladder-like traps along their roots, and when triggered, fill the void in the trap, subsequently pulling the prey in with it. This species is very widespread among the carnivorous plant community, and quite easy to grow. It's specifically a tropical bladderwort, and quite tolerant to a range of conditions. I actually have a clump of it growing on my windowsill, no terrarium needed, but these are all anecdotes, we, we need facts. Tropical, terrestrial bladderworts grow in areas with warm days and cool nights, and always appreciate humidity. They're found growing directly on rocks, waterlogged bogs, and in full sun. Their soil almost always has very little nutrients in it, and they're sensitive to water with high amounts of dissolved solids. We can meet these conditions wonderfully in the lower two-thirds of our terrarium, where it will be in soil that is constantly moist, as well as receive plenty of light, humidity, and plenty of room to grow thanks to the slope that I've built. Now that we have our Utricularia planted, 
we can move on to our first sundew, Drosera adelaide giant form. Commonly known as the Lance Leaf Sundew, Drosera adelaide is a lovely sundew endemic to Queensland, Australia. It grows in shaded areas of the Australian rainforests in very sandy soil. And although it's native to rainforests, Drosera adelaide is tolerant to frost and can actually grow back from its roots if the leaves become damaged over winter. In my opinion, it's probably the most easy and widespread species of Drosera in cultivation. This plant is extremely tolerant to less than satisfactory temperatures and humidity. It grows along riverbanks and on wet rocks, so moisture wouldn't be a concern. And even though it's found in shaded areas, it can tolerate higher light than its closely related sundews, Drosera prolifera and Drosera schizandra. It's incredibly tolerant for a carnivorous plant. And with all this information, I've decided to place my plants as low as I can in the terrarium. They will get less light, which is preferred as it'll get a little bit bigger. They will have higher amounts of water and humidity towards the bottom, as well as being in sphagnum, which is the media I've had the best success with. And it has the largest potential for size, so keeping them there in the bottom with the utricularia will not only decrease competition, but also provide easier access for feeding and pruning. Up next is Drosera pulchella. Among the largest of the pygmy sundews, Drosera pulchella is native to Western Australia and can be found growing alongside cephalotis. As the name suggests, this is a small species that rarely exceeds 20 millimeters in diameter. It forms bright orange traps with green petioles and produces flowers that can rival the size of the plant itself. And although they're small, they're known to grow in clusters that create a glistening, dewy carpet that can cover an area completely. This is primarily due to the production of Gemma, which I'll go over in another video. Pygmy Drosera typically form dormant stipule buds to endure the dry hot summers in Australia. With that in mind, Drosera pulchella is one of the species that grows in moist to wet conditions all summer, so although they can form stipule buds, their unusually large root system allows them access to water year round with no need for dormancy. This pygmy sundew can also be found in swamps, near lakes, and along rivers. It can tolerate lower levels of light, making it a great windowsill plant, and they can reproduce easily through the production of their gemma. With all this information in mind, I'm going to place my clump of pygmies along the outside edge of my live sphagnum moss. They will be lower in the terrarium, getting less intense light. They will have better access to water, allowing their longer roots to utilize the wetter part of our moisture gradient. And although their distance from the opening would make feeding a little complicated, they will have plenty of area to cover in the future. Drosera burmanii, also known as the Burmese sundew, is an annual Drosera found in Australia, West Africa, and all over Asia. Although it's not a pygmy sundew, Drosera burmanii rarely exceeds an inch across. Multiple different types of this species exist as well, all possessing different colors and growth habits. In my experience, the Humpty Doo variety seems to grow very vigorously regardless of their deep red color. Drosera burmanii also happens to be one of the three fastest trapping sundews. The facts about this plant are that it's one of my favorite plants. There's a plethora of information regarding growing this lovely species. It can be found growing in bogs, by lakes, almost anywhere other carnivorous plants in the same regions can be found. They love highlight and can color up very nicely if given enough. They don't mind standing in water and have been seen completely flooded in the wild as well as completely dry. They're not very picky with their humidity either, and if fed, they can grow for years. Our little guy is going right at the beginning of our slope. It'll be getting pretty good amounts of light, its longer root system will have plenty of access to water, and it will be closer to the opening for easier feeding. Our last plant to join them is going to be our juvenile Cephalotus follicularis. Known as the Albany or West Australian pitcher plant, Cephalotus is not the most beginner-friendly plant. It grows in clumps of ground-hugging, colorful pitchers about the size of your thumb, and is native to the coast of southwestern Australia, near Albany. Now I say it isn't beginner-friendly mostly due to the large amount of hearsay and contradicting care information in the community. Some people grow them in pure long fiber sphagnum moss at near 100% humidity, whereas others have had amazing success growing them only in perlite with little attention towards humidity. But fortunately, we still have some concrete information. Cephalotus grow in temperate regions with warm to hot days, cool nights, and frosty winters, with the humidity in Albany rarely dropping below 70%. They can almost always be found in a moist, airy soil, growing in full sun. They require water with little to no dissolved solids, 
and we know that they have extremely sensitive roots, so susceptible to rot that there's a name for it, Cephalotus Sudden Death Syndrome. And with these facts in mind, I can make an educated decision about where in the terrarium I can place this plant. And I'm going to be putting it at the topmost plateau of our terrarium, where it will receive higher amounts of light, plenty of airflow, and a much drier soil. Cool, so every plant is in their new home. This is optional, but I'm going to add one more layer of rinsed sand and tidy things up a little bit. As well as thoroughly misting and almost flooding the terrarium to fully saturate the soil, as well as help it settle itself. My final step is to throw a couple sundew seeds in there, a typical form of Tracera burmanii. The seeds are incredibly small and require high light, humidity, and warm days to germinate. I've had great success in the past germinating these same seeds in my highland cabinet, so these conditions, although are a little warmer, should be just fine. I can see these carnivores setting in quite well, and to help them out a little bit, I'm going to put a layer of saran wrap over the opening of the terrarium, and poke some holes in it to provide some airflow. This will boost humidity in the enclosure, which will help decrease the overall shock the plants experience from this transfer. And over the next few weeks, I'm going to peel back the saran wrap bit by bit to slowly acclimate our new guys to their new home. Now, the fan will come into play once we see any mold or excessive algae growth. Otherwise, I'm confident that we won't have to use it. So how do you guys think I did? Do you think this terrarium will work as designed? Let me know in the comments if you have any tips that'll help this turn into a real jungle in a jar. And not just care tips. If I'm pronouncing something incorrectly, providing the wrong care information, or simply boring you, let me know. Because my goal for this channel is to provide high quality, accurate content about these curious plants, and I can't do that without your help. Thank you guys for watching, and don't forget to like and subscribe.